Well, this painting in the picture here is by uh, Ray Downing. He's kind of famous in the media world. His team analyzed the Shroud of Turin and developed a 3D image from it because it's wrapped around a face, right? So they developed this image. And this uh, painting is from that. And the, back, the fabric in the background is the fabric of the shroud that it, was, that it was made out of. But my point in using it, it does look like a man from near that period. And who knows, it might even be the face of Jesus right there. And that's what we'll talk about today, Jesus as a man. We were watching this Nova show, Joanne and I, on PBS. It's called The Black Hole Apocalypse. You know what that is? <laughs> no, that little blip is from an explosion of an unimaginably violent energy of two black holes colliding 1.3 billion years ago. And then on September 15th, uh, on the September 2015, that gravity wave that that caused reached the earth and just happened to be recorded. The sound was created 1.3 billion years ago and we hear it now. <laughs> Unbelievable. You know, I, at night, I look up at those stars and I think about how very long ago the light from those stars left to reach my eyes. It was billions of years ago. Light years, billions of light. Come on. Of course, now it makes me wonder what's going on up there now. Maybe the whole thing is evaporated for real. I don't know. We are so small and brief compared to the rest of creation, even the Earth. Have you heard that if an apple is shrunk to the, if the Earth is shrunk to the size of an apple, our atmosphere would be like the skin of the apple? Everything we know takes place in that vulnerable little tiny layer of air. And people, as you fly in a jet, I know we've all had this experience, you fly in a jet and you're looking down and the people on the ground soon disappear altogether. You can't see them. And the cars become dots and then are lost in the immensity of the earth and even large cities become brown smears. This happens to be the Twin Cities. It's amazing how small we are. This author of Psalm 8, he was looking up at the stars too, and, and he asked this in Psalm 8, what is man that you remember him? Or the son of man that you care for him? You made him lower than the angels for a short time. You crowned him with glory and honor and subjected everything under his feet. For in subjecting everything to him, he left nothing that's not subjected to him. As it is, we do not see everything that's subjected to him. Actually, I read that wrong. We do not see everything subjected to him. The author of Psalm 8, of course, was thinking of Genesis, right? Genesis 1, 26, 27. God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish and the sea and the birds and the sky and over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God, he created him. With those verses ringing in his mind, the author of Psalm 8 stares up at the stars and makes that stupendous claim. God subjected everything under the feet of humans. That's what the author of Psalm 8 is saying. Everything subjected under the feet of humans. And to clinch it, he writes that God left nothing that's not subjected to humans. <laughs> Why? Because we're made in the image of God. 
were made in the image of God. And then he looks back down at the weeds in his garden and the neighbors fighting down the street and says, as it is, we don't yet see everything subjected to him. Well, we understand that, all right. I mean, how can those opposites even be put together? How can it both be true that humans have complete sovereignty over everything, and yet our weedy garden defies us? Every summer, we know that, right? And in the winter, you got to plow your driveway. That's where the writer of Hebrews comes in. Listen to how he uses Psalm 8 and then starts to explain it. This is Hebrews 2, 5 to 18, and you may not be able to read this tiny little type, but I'll read it to you. For he has not subjected to angels the world to come that we're talking about, but one has somewhere testified, what is man that you remember him? or the son of man that you care for him. You made him lower than the angels for a short time. You crowned him with glory and honor and subjected everything under his feet. For in subjecting everything to him, he left nothing that's not subjected to him. As it is, we do not see everything subjected to him. And verse nine, but we do see Jesus made lower than the angels for a short time, so that by God's grace he might taste death for everyone, crowned with glory and honor because of his suffering in death. Okay, let's look at what this writer is saying. Starting with verse 5, he starts it with the word for. That means he's picking up from where he left off, right? He was saying that Jesus has the ultimate authority to provide salvation to humans. So in Hebrews 2.5, he continues about salvation, calling it the world to come. Using Psalm 8, he talks about a new creation in which humans are no longer messed up by sin. Instead, having been made in the image of God, humans rule his creation so not only is humanity sovereign over this world, but also sovereign over the world to come, the author of Hebrews says. God is planning to replace this world when it wears out and make a new one, a better one. I'm in awe of this creation. And now I read that it's a first draft. There's another world to come. And humans are in charge of that one, too. And creation of humans is so mind-boggling. It's, it's as mind-boggling as the merging of two gigantic black holes, but it's in a far different way. I keep hearing people say that humans aren't all that different from animals, not that much above animals, because we're all made in the same way and, and I'm made of the same stuff. And we've even discovered that animals can think and use tools and do some reasoning. But those researchers have forgotten that they are the ones analyzing the animals, not the other way around. Humans have created vast cities of incredible beauty like Singapore. I'm just amazed. It looks like a science fiction city. And humans, we've journeyed into space. We've seen the far reaches of our solar system and looked down on the poles of Jupiter. We've measured chemicals on planets circling other stars. And finally have oxygen and water. We have a probe out into interstellar space and soon we'll stand on Mars. And sometimes my cell phone still doesn't work. Sin, <laughs> isn't that it? I've been watching videos of children, virtuoso children, doing incredible, impossible things, playing music. One of the instructors says, I don't know how she plays this thing. Her hands aren't big enough to play it, but there she is doing the thing, and her fingers are this long, you know. Humans are amazing. I've seen videos of, of humans throwing themselves around and leaping and dancing and amazing exhibitions of physical prowess and artistic creation. It's incredible. No animal does these things. 
What we can do with our minds and our bodies is mind-boggling. It's as if we are gods. Humans amaze me. Surely we are made in the image of God. But there's a problem. As amazing as we are, we don't see what we were created to be. We are designed to be far more than we are. Our sin has been messing it up. The writer admits we do not yet see everything subjected to him. <laughs> okay, now you've got to be asking, why is he talking about humans instead of Jesus? <laughs> well, that's what the commentators, they don't agree on this. Who are we talking about for real here? The writer of Psalm 8, he was talking about humans. But are humans who the author of Hebrews is talking about? Or is he now talking about Jesus so that Jesus is the true human who will rule the world to come? Well, they wanted to pick sides. I mean, these commentators, they like to, like it's either here or, or there. I don't think it's either humans or Jesus. I think it's both. It's writing about both humans and Jesus. Psalm 8 is saying his humanity has taken back control of everything in the person of Jesus. How can he make such a claim, the writer of Hebrews? Because he's also referring to Psalm 110. As the writers of scriptures combine these two passages all the time. Psalm 110 says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until you, I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Jesus even quoted this for himself. Paul the Apostle combined Psalm 8 and Psalm 110 in his prayer for believers in Ephesians 1, 18 to 23. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he's called you the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but in the one to come. And... God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Humanity in Jesus. See there? Humans rule under the authority of Jesus our God. He fills us in every way by his Holy Spirit, for we are made in the image of God. Philippians 3, 20 to 21, Paul combines humanity and Jesus in this promise for humanity's new life. He says, our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power of that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. And that's good news when you hurt, isn't it? Amen. You will be transformed. And 1 Peter 3.22, Peter also explains about Jesus, the true human. Now that he has gone into heaven, he is at God's right hand with the angels, authorities, and powers subjected to him. After listening to those passages, we can begin to understand how the author of Hebrews combined Jesus and humanity using Psalm 8 and Psalm 110. He's not saying that either humans or Jesus are given control of creation. He's saying that Jesus is the human who's taken up sovereignty over creation and that humans were meant to have all along. Jesus is the human that did it. But how could the authors of the New Testament combine these two psalms that aren't related at all, Psalm 8 and Psalm 110? The Jewish scholars, 
they never associated Psalm 8 with the Messiah, and very few of them associated Psalm 110 with the Messiah. How do the disciples get the idea of combining these things and writing them in the New Testament? They got it from Jesus. That's what he taught them. And the disciples continued to teach as he instructed them. This is direct from Jesus. Now here's why this is important to me, and maybe to you. I have questioned for such a long time how one man's life could affect everything. It just seemed, I don't know, some kind of Western mythology or something. But that claim, and the writer of Hebrews is explaining it, that's pretty much what the whole book of Hebrews is about. How can one man have affected everything? So verse 9 stops talking about humanity, how about humanity's failure to live up to what we were made to be, and instead focuses on Jesus. He writes, but we do see Jesus. What about Jesus are we supposed to be seeing? The answer is a very strange statement to say about anybody. By God's grace, he might taste death. So that by, his, by God's grace, Jesus might taste death. I mean, I've never heard the word grace and death put together before. They don't go together. Grace brought death? That's very strange. The author is saying that the grace of God sent Jesus to his death. I just don't think of suffering and death as the grace of God, do you? Well, that's just the very place when we begin to understand the answer to how one man's life and death could have affected everything. This is how. The eternal Son of God, who was far above angels, became human, a little less than the angels. Why? So that he could be a real human, not some God in a bodysuit. He needed to be vulnerable to everything humans go through, including death. He must be human. And so he was as vulnerable as a human being and died as all humans must. But because of who he also was, God resurrected his body and more than just the res resuscitation of a corpse to make some sort of a weird zombie, God recreated the body of Jesus into some new and glorious form, transformed it. And Paul calls it a spiritual body. So there's part of the answer to my question, how could one man's life and death affect everything? Jesus had to be a man in order to rule the creation as humanity was designed to do. But to do that, he had to be the complete image of God in humanity. So God himself became the image of God in a real human man. That's how he did it. That's why it affected everything. Jesus demonstrated what such a human is capable of. He said, if you had the faith of a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move over there, and it would do it. That's what humans are capable of. That's what he said. But the only way Jesus could complete the image of God in humans is if he died in order to be resurrected and transformed. It was necessary. Then God raised him to the place where he could rule creation. This is another painting by that same artist from the Shroud of Turin. 
God raised him to the place where he could rule creation back above the angels, back to the throne in heaven, crowned with glory and honor because of his suffering and death. So now, we have a better glimpse and understand more clearly why it was the grace of God that allowed Jesus to die. It was the grace to Jesus because it resulted in his glory and great joy. It's grace to us because we will be restored to our place, sovereign over creation through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Your destiny is incredible. Oh, I shouldn't use the word incredible, according to Davy, because that means you can't believe it, right? Maybe you don't have any other words for it. One eternal day, we will see the universe blow out like a tired candle. Everything will fall into trillions of black holes. That's what this PBS Nova thing said. Everything will fall into all the black holes, and they think now that black holes are nothing at all. Everything will be gone. And then God will make everything new again. And we will be there to rejoice with the angels. We will join with the stars as they shout for joy and that will be our forever home. We were made to live in an environment like this and rule. Oh my Jesus, let it be. The Lord of the universe has promised and he will do it. Do you know who you are now? Amen. <laughs>